Hi everyone, this is Dr. Nelly. So today I want to talk about the lab this week, which is on atomic emission spectrum. In the lecture, we've talked about this phenomenon that if you take a pure substance in a gas form and you run electricity through them, that gas gaseous substance can then emit light, right? And so this is an example of various types of light and colors that are emitted by these substances when you heat them. And you have heard this term before, neon lights, because one of the substances that we use is neon gas, and it would emit light of a certain color. So you can take any element like sodium, uh, mercury, helium, etc., and they all will emit different types of lights. So the goal today is to take that light that's emitted by one of those substances and then split them into the component waves. Now remember, we talked also in lecture about this, that if you take white light and you put a prism to try to split that white light into its components, you find something called a continuous spectrum, uh, be, meaning that white light is really composed of all of these light waves uh, that combine together to make it look white. However, with the pure substances in the gas form that I mentioned earlier, they're different because when you take those substances and you pass them through something like a prism that would be able to split them, you find that they're composed of individual lines, which we call line spectrum. So that's what we're going to be doing today. We're going to try to use several different sources of light from different elements. And we're going to try to see the different line spectra that are generated by these sources of light. And in some cases, we're going to try to calculate or predict what wavelengths those uh, lights are going to be. There are a few parts of this lab. The first one is you're going to construct a spectrometer which is something that allows you to split the light that comes in and break it into different components. You're going to construct that spectrometer to measure the wavelength of the various uh, elemental gases. Before you can actually use the spectrometer to measure these wavelengths, you first have to calibrate it. So we're going to do this with a mercury source. Once the spectrometer has been um, calibrated, you can then use it to actually measure wavelengths. So you're going to take a noble gas and measure five wavelengths of that noble gas. And then the next part of it is you're going to take a hydrogen gas source and measure three wavelengths from that hydrogen gas. Let me show you the setup of the spectroscope, okay, because this is really important. So you're going to set it up this way. You're going to have this meter stick that's been uh, connected together. Uh, to form a letter T. So you're going to put that in the middle of a bench and um, then on top of the middle stick right at the T you're going to put your power source where you can put in your gas tube or discharge tube. Okay, So that's going to place, be placed inside the power source and then when the power source is turned on then that thing will light up. Okay, uh, On the bottom part of the T you're going to put a uh, stand and then on the stand, you're going to have a clamp that's going to clamp on a diffraction grating. This diffraction grating acts like your prism. And if you look through the diffraction grating, either on this side or on this side, you'll see that this light, which shines, and so the light hits the diffraction grating and then it gets split, you're going to see that on this side, it will show lines uh, that compose that particular element. Okay, so that's the way this thing should be set up. Now, a couple of points I want to make. You want to make sure that the stand is placed about a quarter of the way into the meter stick, a quarter to a third of the way, okay, on the bottom from the T. So you don't want to put it right here at the very bottom. You don't want to put it too close to the source. You want to put it about a third to a quarter of the way. That provides you with the sort of the best uh, splitting and the best way to observe those lines on this side of the meter stick. Okay. The other part I want to mention is you want to choose a darker uh, space in the lab. So I'm going to turn off all the lights in the lab, but there's some lights that are going to be left on due to emergency reasons. So what we're going to have to do is for what you have to do is find a space that's dark enough to actually make sure you can see uh, all the lines pretty clearly. Here's that same picture again with a uh, light source now being turned on so you can clearly see that there is some 
light coming out of there. So if I were to put myself here and look through the diffraction grating on this side, I'll see a bunch of lines that appear on top of that meter stick. This is a quick illustration of what you expect to see. You're going to be standing here, you're going to see those lines here. And when you're calibrating, this is what you're going to be doing. You're going to have your mercury light source right here. And basically each of the lines that you're going to show up have already uh, have a wavelength assigned to them. So the wavelength for the mercury source is going to be the ones listed here and they have their own color. So what you should see is you should see four lines when you put mercury there on your through your diffraction grating. Now the blue one will be pretty light so that one is a little hard to see but then all the other three should be pretty easy to see and you can figure out that the blue has to be between the violet and the green. So what you do then is you try to find those lines and each line already has a um, wavelength assigned to them. Now what you do to calibrate is basically you measure the distance from the center of the meter stick to that line. So let's say this is your dark violet line. So you're going to measure the distance from this to here and let's say that's 12.3 centimeters. You would write that on your table next to the um, wavelength. So 404.7 nanometers then corresponds to 12.3 centimeters on the meter stick. And you do that for all the other ones as well. So then you have a table of four of these wavelengths with four of the distances on the meter stick. You can then plot this on ex in Excel and then create a plot of a line, which basically is an equation that relates lambda to distances on the meter stick. That's your calibration wavelength. That's your calibration equation. Now, once you have that uh, calibration data, then it's just a matter of measuring two additional sources of light. You're going to use a noble gas for the second part. And you're going to measure five of the wavelengths that come out from the noble gas. Um, later on, when you calculate the wavelength, you have to compare that to a source uh, from an organization called the NIST. And basically what you're comparing is, you know, how's your experimental measurement compared to a value that people have accepted as convention for that wavelength. Real quick, this is what the NIST website looks like. And you can see here at the bottom, there's several, uh, all of the elements that could generate lights are listed here. So for example, if I'm working with helium, I'm going to click on that. And then it shows me helium. And then I want to find my strong lines. Okay. And then, uh, since I'm making my measurement in air, I'm not going to choose vacuum. I'm going to scroll down here to air. And this is listed in angstroms, which is 10 to the minus 10 meter. So to go to nanometer, you have to divide all these numbers by 10. So let's say you find a wavelength. One of the things that's important is you're looking only at the strong lines, right? Which is the strong intensity lines. This column is for intensity. So let's say you calculated a wavelength that's 300 you know, 92 nanometers, okay? So you go to 392 nanometers, you look at these numbers here and you see, well, 396 is kind of close, right? But then you notice that the intensity is only 20, whereas 388.8 has an intensity of 300. Since you're only looking at the most intense lines, it's unlikely that the line you observe at 392 is actually this one, it's more likely to be that one. So when you compare your value and you calculate percent error, you want to choose this number to compare it to instead of that number because that number is more intense and therefore more uh, likely to be the correct uh, line that you actually observe. Last source uh, of light you want to use is the hydrogen gas. And hydrogen gas is, uh, we use this for the specific reason that we have equations that we use in the Bohr model to calculate the wavelength of the hydrogen emission lines, right? As a quick reminder from lecture, this was the equation that we have for electronic transition in the hydrogen atom. So if you go from, let's say, 4 to 2, you're going to put your n final as 2, your n initial as 4. And remember that that energy of electronic transition, the energy released by the electrons as it goes from a higher to a lower orbit, it actually is going to be uh, observed as light, okay? So the energy here is equal to the energy of light, and the energy of light could be written as h nu or hc over lambda. So then you can calculate ahead of time 
what values of lambda you're going to observe, right? Given the transition from various and initial to and final. Now remember, we're going to be, these are light that you're going to observe with your naked eye, so it's going to be visible light. So remember that if that's visible light, that means the final uh, orbit has to be 2. That's called the Balmer series, okay? And so that's what you have to do in the last part. You have to calculate a bunch of these wavelengths. Then you have to make your observation on your spectroscope to see if you are able to observe at least three of those lines, okay? So you want to pick the lines that, you know, make sense, again, with your, with your um, uh, calculation. Now, one of the things I want to mention is a lot of times this hydrogen uh, gas has other lines that are present there. It might be contamination lines. It might be lines from other sources. Um, so that's why we, you want to calculate this ahead of time. When you calculate this, you can do this actually at home if you want because we already discussed this in lecture. You calculate this ahead of time and then afterwards you just, when you go to the lab, you already have a series of wavelengths that you know you should focus on and then you just go to those range uh, in your spectroscope to try to detect the most intense one, okay?